हेलो एंड अस्सलाम वालेकुम नाज़रीन टीवी एपिक्स की हमेशा कोशिश रही है कि आपको हर किस्म की कम्युनिटी बेस्ड तकरीबा दिखाई जा सकें चाहे वो इंग्लैंड से हो लंदन से हो या पाकिस्तान से हो लेकिन एक ख़ास कोशिश ये रही है कि किसी भी किस्म की इल्मी और अदबी और दानश मंदाना दानश वराना जो तकरीबा होती हैं उनका हाल आपको ज़रूर सुनाया जाए इसी कोशिश में हम आज ख़ास तौर पर आए हैं कैम्ब्रिज यूनिवर्सिटी और मौका है पाकिस्तान के मायना सपूत मशहूर साइंटिस्ट एजुकेशनिस्ट डॉक्टर अता रहमान साहब का लेक्चर कैम्ब्रिज यूनिवर्सिटी के अंदर आइए नाजरीन हम उनसे बात भी करते हैं और उनकी बात भी सुनते हैं और देखते हैं यहाँ पे क्या हो रहा है तो चलिए हमारे साथ Um, he received his PhD uh, in the subject from King's College, Cambridge, and then he was elected to a research fellowship, and now he is an honorary fellow there. Uh, Professor Atta was the Federal Minister for Science and Technology in Pakistan and the Chairman of the Higher Education Commission from 2002 to 2008. Um, he is regarded to have revived the higher education and research sectors in Pakistan, and will be speaking on how these sectors are faring today. as well as what the future holds for them um the talk will be followed by a panel discussion on higher education in pakistan um as our panelists we have professor harun ahmed uh, he is an emeritus professor of microelectronics at cambridge and the former master of corpus christi college uh, he worked for the pakistani higher education commission for 2 years helping to establish branches of european universities in pakistan he is also an expert on technical education in uh, continental european countries such as sweden Uh, Germany and France. Uh, we have Dr. Kamal Munir as our uh, thir- uh, third panelist. He has been teaching at the Judd Business School since 2000 and at McGill University in Canada before then. Um, his research focuses on social change and stability, uh, as well as innovation and technological shifts in society. He has consulted for the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, uh, as well as the Government of Pakistan. Um, as uh, we also have a final year PhD student, uh, Safwan Akram, on the panel. He is a scholar from the Higher Education Commission in Pakistan. Uh, he did his undergrad in Pakistan, so he will provide a valuable uh, student perspective on the impact of HEC policies on Pakistani higher education. So now, without further ado, I would like I would invite uh, Professor Tarahman to begin his presentation. My presentation would be basically I will be talking about uh, four uh, different areas. Firstly, the world of discovery, the world we live in. Uh, uh, some statements about the Islamic world. most of my presentation will be concerned with pakistan and what has been happening in the higher education sector and then a, a few slides about my research center before we end we live in a world where innovation determines progress and uh, so countries that have realized that the, that their real wealth lie lie in their children and not in gold or minerals or other natural resources those are the ones that have moved forward rapidly and we also live in a world where truth is stranger than fiction every day brings a thousand discoveries and many of them are transforming our lives for instance in a room of this size you can make thousands of plants without any seeds uh, using tissue culture technologies some scientists have taken genes from the firefly and put them into orchids and so lo and behold you have luminescent orchids which uh, shine like the fireflies uh, a french company has developed a car which runs just purely on air it just got, got a high pressure air cylinder at the back it doesn't need a combustion engine and you just refill it with air and it goes on for 250 kilometers and ta- it's just been licensed out to tata for manufacture you have aeroplanes which are able to fly without internal fuel once they reach a uh, mach 5 mach 12 12 times the speed of sound they can use oxygen present in the stratosphere and use that as fuel uh you have paralyzed moving wheelchairs with thought control they just wear a cap with sensors and that senses the encephalographic signals and blood pressure changes and so a completely paralyzed person all has he has to do is to think i want my wheelchair to go there it goes there my wheelchair to go there and it goes there uh you have uh, uh not very long ago you have the, a claim from cern in 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 uh, geneva that uh, uh, particle neutrinos faster than light have been discovered and that's shaken the very foundations of the einstein theory of general relativity it remains to be uh, proved by other laboratories reproduced but uh, but it is 
uh, something which is of great interest presently. Uh, you have blind, completely blind people being able to see with their tongue. And that's, uh, 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 there's a company called YCAB in Wisconsin, which has developed this device where you, a, they, they have a little camera uh, fitted on their glasses and they, uh, which takes in the optical signals. These are converted into electrical signals by a device in the pocket. And uh, these electrical signals are transferred onto a lollipop-like device in the mouth of the blind person. And this restores partial eyesight, allowing them to distinguish between a knife and a fork uh, or see the lift buttons. And this has been used for uh, some British soldiers and American soldiers who, who had uh, lost their eyes in the war in Afghanistan and Iraq. And you have cyborg beetles, uh, partial insects, partial uh, robots which can sit on the wall of uh, our Prime Minister and transfer all the information and all the talk talking that's going on to some embassies not very far away uh, and uh, uh, fitted with cameras and sound detection systems. And the, you have nano machines using nanotechnology which can pass uh, little machines, these are all atoms uh, which can go through your blood vessels and clear up the clots and so on. You have metamaterials, so the Harry Potter book that Cloaking device is now a reality. You can actually, you now do have metamaterials meta which would bend light around uh, wherever, whatever object is coated with it. And so these are being used uh, to make objects invisible. So tanks or other uh, 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 military submarines or other uh, uh, devices can be made invisible using metamaterials. Uh, you have bulletproof jackets made of cellulose, paper, but nanocellulose, and this is stronger than steel. Stem cells are transforming the way medicine is uh, may be practiced in the future. A recent development was the uh, uh, conversion of cellulose to butanol, an isobutanol by a microorganism. And uh, this is particularly interesting because uh, what's interesting about butanol and isobutanol is that these can be used 100% in car engines without uh, any changes, any modifications in the car engines. And uh, so you may be running your cars on old newspapers in the future. Uh, uh, last year, uh, there was an anti-aging compound discovered and which may be of interest to some of us oldies here, uh, which is that uh, at the end of your DNA, there is a cap called uh, the telomere, and this is a telomerase activator. And uh, when they gave this compound to aging mice, the mice became younger. So, <laughs> so uh, there, there are lots of very interesting things going on, and of course, gene therapy and optical computers. So it's a world where truth is indeed stranger than fiction, and I write an article every Sunday in our main newspaper, Dawn, uh, about the, some of these wondrous happenings, just to excite young men and women that scientific uh, science is fun. And, but let me turn a little bit to the o Islamic countries. If you look at the African OIC countries, Organization of Islamic uh, Cooperation, OIC, uh, uh, they are spending 3% per percent on defense, about 2% on health, but only 0.1% on research and development. Whereas if you look at the Asian OIC countries, 4.1% on defense, 0.3%, and this is an average uh, on research and development, so 0.3%. And the Arab OIC countries, in spite of their funds, 7.1% on defense and 0.2% on research and development. So that is the real problem in most of the Islamic world, that we are spending far too little on education, on research, and uh, a lot of money is spent on buying these expensive toys, F-16s, F-15s, whatever you call them, and they soon become outdated and you go around shopping for some more. Uh, but there are some positive changes which are coming up. Uh, for instance, as compared to the year 2000, when only about 18,000 or so articles were published by the OIC member countries, that number has gone up to 63,000, uh, had gone up uh, to about 63,000 in 2009. Uh, but still, uh, it is far too low. It's uh, less, for instance, the entire Islamic world taken together. The publications are less than what's, what are published from just the United Kingdom. So that just goes to show that uh, the, while many of them have funds, they are not being utilized uh, properly. 
Malaysia for, has done quite well. It has been spending about 25 percent of its budget on education for the last 30 years. And today, would you believe it, 87 percent of all high-tech exports from the Islamic world, 87 percent come just from one country, Malaysia. Let me turn now to Pakistan and talk about what we are doing. Uh, I came into the cabinet a little late. Uh, President Musharraf uh, had already, uh, uh, the, the new government had come in in uh, October two uh, in uh, October 1999, and uh, so in March 2000, I joined the cabinet, and uh, uh, I uh, managed to persuade the government at the time uh, that uh, we have to invest more on. Uh, science and technology and on uh, education and uh, there was a, a, a overall a 6000 percent increase in the development budget of higher education uh, of of the of the ministry of science and technology and a 2400 percent increase in the budget for higher education uh, because I, I i said it's not the job of uh, usa or uk or other advanced countries to uh, train pakistani students we must put our money in our children. And uh, so that allowed a large number of new programs to begin uh, and uh, to address the key challenges in higher education, which are quality access, what percentage of students have access to higher education, and to relevance, how relevant is whatever we are, whatever education we are giving them. Uh, I was for some time, for about two years, also the Federal Minister responsible for uh, information technology and telecommunications. And at that time, in August 2000, we had only about 29 cities which had access to internet. This was expanded rapidly, and uh, within a matter of two and a half years, we had some 2,000 towns, cities, and villages which had access to internet. This was uh, very important. These are the knowledge highways, these are the trade highways. In many ways, they are more important than the road highways that we are used to. Uh, similarly, fiber was expanded very rapidly from 40 cities to 1,000 cities within a matter of four, four and a half years. Internet user uh, usage uh, expanded uh, very fast, and the costs of bandwidth were brought down from a ridiculous $87,000 uh, per month for an E1 line down to uh, some $3,000, and they are now even lower. And uh, mobile telephony also uh, expanded very fast uh, due to certain decisions that we took. Previously, pe one had to pay for receiving a call, so the common man uh, was reluctant to hold a mobile phone because somebody else is calling and I'm having to pay for his or her call. So we switched that, lowered the rates, brought in U-Phone as, as a competitor, so and said the calling party must pay. And then that explosion of mobile telephony started al also at that time. Uh, and uh, from some 300,000 telephones, three million telephones were ordered within a few months, and that's over 100, 100 and 110 million now. Uh, and this laid the foundation later on uh, when I then moved to the Higher Education Commission uh, for uh, the Pakistan Educational Research Network, uh, the PERN 1 and now it's PERN 2, which connects all universities with high-speed internet connectivity under the PERN 2 program. Uh, it's one gigabit connectivity to every university, and, and these are then connected to 10 gigabit loops around major cities, and dark fiber also to special institutions where you require uh, traffic with uh, no commercial traffic. And this then, on this platform, we establish a nationwide digital library so that every student uh, in every public sector university uh, in Pakistan today has free access to some 20,000 full text journals with back volumes and some 60,000 textbooks uh, and monographs from 220 international publishers, which are keyword searchable and downloadable. Prior to this, uh, most libraries hardly had half a dozen journals uh, with them. So this suddenly made available a huge uh, repository of knowledge uh, uh, to the universities. Uh, it was free for the universities because the government paid for it. And uh, <coughs> under this uh, program, uh, we had uh, we also set up excellent video conferencing facilities uh, in different universities. So every public sector university has uh, excellent uh, video conferencing facilities, and uh, this is the high-speed connectivity, and then campus management solutions, etc. 
and this is the library download uh, usage uh, which expanded uh, phenomenally during those few years from just a few hundred thousand to over eight million downloads. And the video conferencing facility now allows lectures to be delivered live and interactively from uh, professors across the world uh, which are delivered to students in Pakistan. Uh, these are not just odd uh, lectures but complete courses are now being delivered by eminent professors uh, from across the world and students who are at in the undergraduate level or at the postgraduate level can attend these lectures. These are followed by exams and those students who pass these exams, those credits are recognized by their respective universities at, as part of their coursework requirements. So this is an excellent program which is on the way and this is not confined to Pakistan. I'm actually heading this program at the moment and we, so Sri Lanka, Thailand, we have just signed an MOU with uh, with India on this and so we are expanding this to other developing countries and soon some African countries will also be joining in. Uh, this is uh, President Musharraf sitting there uh, uh, talking to an Australian professor. He visited us uh, this some years ago and the Australian professor was giving a lecture uh, uh, in the, in the, on medicine and uh, they started talking cricket with each other because there was a, there was a time when there was a cricket match going on between the two countries. <laughs> well, in Pakistan we have about 170 odd million odd people uh, but 54 percent of them are young below the age of 19. That's a huge resource of young talent. In many Western countries, uh, also ma in many countries in Asia, uh, they are worried because they have uh, dwindling populations of young people opting for careers in maths, physics, engineering, <coughs> and many departments in this country I know uh, also closed down uh, because there were not enough interest in certain scientific fields. And here we have uh, a, a, a very large number of young people and this is a double-edged sword. If you can, this is both a challenge and an opportunity. If you can provide them with training and opportunities to contribute, then uh, they can help in, uh, boost the country and help the process of socio-economic development. If you don't, then they become a huge burden. But how do we excite young people to opt for careers in education, science, and technology when a young boy or girl has just completing his O levels or A levels and thinking about what do I do in life as a career. Uh, what we want is that they should follow their noses and, and do what excites them. But uh, how do we attract them towards academic careers? Well, of course, we have to excite young minds that science is fun. It's like being paid for a love, love affair, if I may put it that way, that uh, it's not about a nine to five job. Uh, we have to select and train them and send them to the top universities, but very importantly, we then have to attract them back, not just by legal bonds and, or by other uh, compulsions, but by just by creating an enabling environment. And that enabling environment is not just salary structures, it includes uh, access to research grants, it includes access to, uh, to libraries, it includes uh, access to sophisticated instrumentation and also just clustering of people, just the ability that for them to talk to an, a, a critical mass of people trained in a field within each department so that they can talk and communicate and discuss matters with each other. That's also very important. So uh, uh, one thing that we did besides this access to library was to make a dramatic change in the salary structures. Uh, and uh, Pakistan probably became the only country in the world where the salary of a professor in a university became five times the salary of a federal minister in the government. Uh, but we linked it to performance. We said not just paying weak people high salaries is just a sheer wastage of money. So what we uh, said was this was a 10-year track system which was introduced across the country in the universities uh, that you will be on contract for three years and then if you will perform well, you will be evaluated by an international panel of experts in technologically advanced countries and then you can be extended for a further three years and then you can either be given tenure or you'll be asked to go. And uh, we reduced the taxes uh, from 35 percent to 5 percent. And uh, but our main program was on developing bright young faculty. Universities, good universities are not about beautiful buildings, they're about beautiful minds. 
And so uh, the, the best way to improve the quality of our university and quality of education was to invest in the brightest young men and women. And there's no shortage of creativity uh, in Pakistan. As you would see from the O-level and A-level results, our students uh, are, some of them are amongst the top in the world. So there's no lack of creativity. What we need to do is to have a very strict merit-based system which identifies the brightest and then provides them opportunities for training. So we introduced a system under which uh, HEC Higher Education Commission grants uh, for scholarships were given. There was, a nation, there was a nationwide exam every three months and uh, so 15 to 20,000 students appeared in these exams every three months. The best 500 were shortlisted and then we would invite teams of uh, professors from the countries uh, where these students were supposed to go for studies to come to Pakistan and go to Islamabad, Karachi, Lahore, Peshawar, etc. Hold the interviews of the students directly with no one from the Higher Education Commission involved so that uh, the final selections were made by the foreign professors. So a lot of these scholarships were for Germany or France or Italy and we had these teams of visitors of professors coming in and selecting. This of course anno anno annoyed a lot of people, the ministers and even people higher up because Sefarish or recommendations were not <laughs> listened to and uh, uh, yet uh, the result was that some of uh, very bright young men and women came across uh, uh, to the West uh, and also some to Korea and China uh, to avail scholarships uh, at the uh, postgraduate level, largely at the postgraduate level. Also a split PhD program was introduced uh, to boost the indigenous scholarship program so they could, they could spend the middle 18 months uh, in, a, uh, in a suitable laboratory in a foreign country. And that was also very useful uh, because it helped to develop linkages. Uh, one of the things that we did was each student who was going back uh, after his or her PhD, uh, even a year before completion of uh, the doctor degree, uh, they were allowed to apply for a research grant of up to $100,000, each one of them. And so that uh, over a three year period, and uh, so those uh, who came back would then have the opportunity of, even if they were going to a weak university in a relatively remote part of Pakistan, they would have access to uh, research grant facilities. Uh, and also this was linked to a linkage with their respective departments. The indigenous PhD programs was, were also promoted. So uh, for full PhDs, about 5,000 students were sent abroad and there were a large number of linkages with foreign universities established, uh, a large number of linkages with British universities, initially funded fully by the Higher Education Commission, but later on the British Council also provides partly the funding for these universities. And there were ag agreements made with uh, various countries for training students uh, in different uh, universities. The world's largest Fulbright program was also initiated with half the funds coming from the Higher Education Commission and the other half uh, from uh, the Fulbright Foundation through USAID. So there were the, these are just some details of scholarships that were awarded and availed. And we also attracted back a large number of people who were f professors from abroad, Pakistani diaspora who had been settled in Europe or USA. So some 600 of them came back, about half of them on a permanent basis, the other half on short-term assignments. So for instance, in Lahore, the Government College University in Lahore, there's a mathematics center, uh, which has been developed largely through foreign professors, and a lot of them are from Europe, uh, who have come in, uh, and started working there. So there was this program to attract back people from abroad uh, to Pakistan. Uh, so split postdoctoral interactive lectures, focus on quality assurance, standardization of degree programs. Uh, previously, people used to get a, an undergraduate degree only after two years, so we just changed that because we felt that broader education uh, was required. So a four-year undergraduate program was introduced uh, in universities, and a special focus was on faculty development, existing faculty members being uh, th their background and knowledge being improved uh, through training at different levels. This is how our money was spent. Most of it was in, is in blue, which is human resource development, uh, and some of it uh, in infrastructure and uh, equipment and access to information. 
we placed Pakistan's uh, first satellite, Parksat 1, was acquired and placed uh, at 38 degrees east. It had footprints and it was used largely for education uh, by the virtual university which was established in Lahore and uh, that has done very well. And these figures tell you what happened. Uh, Pakistan was, fo was established in 1947 and 1947 to 2002 in that 55 years we had reached a total number of students which were about 276,000. This was the total enrollment in Pakistani universities in 2002. By 2010 that number had increased to 948,000. So there was uh, more than a tripling of enrollment in our universities. Uh, the number of uh, public sector universities and degree awarding institutes also grew from 59 in the year 2000 to 137 now. And this just goes to show how the enrollment has gone up. So the, to the access uh, has, uh, of the age group between 17 to 23, the access was only 2.6% of that age group had access to higher education back in 2000. That has gone up to about 7.8%, still very low. We should be in the 30% range, but there has been a tripling, and the, and the trend is positive. And the gender-wise enrollment has evened out. Green is the men, and the red is the uh, women. So there's only a difference of a few percent now between the, in the total enrollment in Pakistani universities uh, between the men and women. But very interestingly, uh, because of our emphasis on research and uh, the research grant program that we provided, there was uh, some 600 percent increase in uh, internationally abstracted publications in impact factor journals and about a thousand percent increase in citations uh, after removing self-citations. And uh, uh, the, uh, the number of research publications this shows what the trend was, 1994 to the year 2001, you know, we were about 600, 700 publications per year in international journals. Then that started rising and in 2011 we had over 5,000 publications, about 5,500. This was, uh, 2010 it was 4,651. So Pakistan is about the same as India now in terms of research publications in international journals per million population. India has about 40, 45,000, so we are about the same as India today. So this has been a major change. Previously we were about eight times or ten times less. So, but the trend is very interesting because in spite of the difficulties that the Higher Education Commission has faced in the last few years, uh, which I will uh, mention in a few minutes, uh, that this trend continues. And this is largely because of bright young people completing their doctorates here, going back and adding to the faculty uh, the research faculty that is present in the universities. Pakistan's share of world articles has about tripled uh, in this period, in the last 10 years. And uh, the, these are various other details. I'm not going to take <coughs> into numbers, travel grants given, seminars, and so on. Uh, this is interesting. The increase, 1947 to 2002, the total number of PhDs awarded in a, by our universities were only 3,279. In 55 years uh, of our existence, all our universities together, that was the universities were and many of them still are low level colleges. They're not really, it's not really proper to call them universities because the difference between a college and a university is, uh, is often not well understood. A college is largely about a transfer of existing knowledge. A university has an additional very more important task, which is creation of new knowledge. And uh, so with the emphasis that was placed in research from 2003 o onwards, we had, uh, in fact, 3,944 publications in the subsequent, uh, 3,944 PhDs produced in the subsequent nine years. Uh, this is just a PhD graduates from local university. But uh, numbers without quality can do far more damage than good. So previously there was a trend to just send PhD thesis to local people, people who are friends and so on. So we said no, all thesis have to go to professors in technologically advanced countries. And uh, only t if two of them concur that yes, the quality of the work is high enough to deserve a PhD without adopting a condescending attitude that this is for Pakistan. Uh, so only then would a local viva be held. 
they should they would also need to have uh, at least one research publication in an international good impact factor journal. And uh, thirdly, uh, a lot of the cut, cut and paste things that went on was controlled by having every university uh, mandated to check every thesis and every research publication through software which was distributed and made available, authenticate or turn it in. Uh, there are a number of versions. So, and so the emphasis was on quality and plagiarism, as I said, was checked. Uh, and, uh, and as a result, a number of universities came up in the top few hundred of the world. And we also then said these universities have an, an, another important role to play, which is to promote uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. That was something that we were discussing just now. So we uh, then promoted the establishment of technology parks. And these are now coming up now. There's one which has been established at the National University of Science and Technology, another agriculture in University of Faslabad, the third one is coming up at Karachi University, and uh, uh, established a fund which will allow, allow university industry linkages so that uh, uh, the problem would emanate from the industry, it would not emanate from the university. And the university would then say, uh, the, the industry can then partner with anybody in the, in the universities to stab to solve a specific problem that the industry is facing and 80 percent of the funds would come from the government only 20 percent would, would come from uh, the uh, industry itself so it was a uh, uh, and under that many projects were funded uh, uh, through these linkages that were established a large number of centers were established uh, which were relevant to national needs whether it was date palm research center or uh, advanced manufacturing engineering at UET Lahore or gemstone training and uh, halophyte utilization. So there are a large number which were linked to whatever needs were and uh, which are on the applied side. Similarly, there were a large number of offices established for research, innovation and, uh, and commercialization uh, and uh, a focus. And, the and there has been a, uh, a trend now uh, to uh, establish incubators and centers for, an, for innovation and entrepreneurship and also to advi give advice and to, uh, and on how to uh, develop a good business plan and how to take a loan from a bank so that uh, students who pass out from universities are not jo just job seekers, they have uh, some ability to establish their own companies if they are good ideas. So these are various technology and business incubators which are established and a number of centers of excellence are also now in the process of being formed. Uh, our ranking started going up, so we have now uh, <laughs> several universities uh, in, ranked in the top 500. NAST is at 250 at, and amongst the engineering universities, still not amongst the top 100. It'll take another 10, 15 years of hard effort before we have one in the top 100. But at least we have some now uh, which are in the top 300, 400, 500 bracket. And the trend is good, so uh, that's what's more important. Uh, there have been glowing uh, international uh, reviews about what Pakistan has done. Three comprehensive reports came out, uh, which I'd be happy to share with any of you who are interested. One was about the World Bank, who actually did an, e did an year long uh, detailed survey of the situation that was in Pakistan and published this report on higher education, another by the USAID, and a third by British Council. <coughs> And Nature has published four uh, reviews, uh, four editorials, I beg your pardon, on Pakistan, on higher education in Pakistan. The first entitled The Paradox of Pakistan, uh, which was published in 2007, talked of uh, this strange country with torn by terrorism and bombings and so on, and yet in the same country, uh, you have this uh, excellent program in higher education. Then after President Musharraf left, there was another editorial uh, which was headed after Musharraf. And uh, it uh, uh, basically it said, do not go back to the Stone Age. And that was the words that they used, which existed before uh, President Musharraf came in. And this higher education program was started and, uh, uh, and said that this program must be continued and further magnified. And two more editorials. The the last one was on my birthday, incidentally, the 22nd of September. And I was amused by the words. It called me a force of nature, <laughs> whatever that meant. <laughs> but it was, uh, I was humbled and amused by that editorial. Uh, 
uh, and we won a number of prizes uh, to ask the Academy of Science of the Developing World. The Royal Society in London, uh, of which I happen to be a member, came forward with a new, uh, with a booklet called A New Golden Age. And uh, it talked about various Islamic countries and what was going on in higher education and science in diff these different countries. And it uh, then said Pakistan is the, as, as the best practice model to be followed by other developing countries. Strangely enough, Indian, the, uh, the Indian government uh, became worried at what, what, was, what was going on in Pakistan. And there was a pre presentation made to the Indian Prime Minister uh, by uh, the advisor to the Indian PM on Science and Technology, Professor C. N. R. Rao. And this was then uh, published in Hindustan Times on 23rd July 2006 under the heading Park Threat to Indian Science and, uh, by Neha Mehta. And, uh, uh, and it started with Pakistan may soon join China in giving India serious competition in science. I don't think India, India had anything to worry about. I think they're at least 15 years ahead of us. So, <laughs> but it was amusing that the Indians got <laughs> a bit agitated. Incidentally, India has now decided to do away with the University Grants Commission, just like Pakistan had done. And uh, just two months ago, uh, a new body uh, is being formed in India called the National Commission for Higher Education and Research, NCHR. And, uh, so, to, to, uh, which will give much more centralized uh, control over what's going on there. But we must, uh, you know, science must be used to build bridges between nations. And I happen to be the president of the Pakistan Academy of Sciences, so I extended my hands to India and invited the president of the Indian Academy of Sciences, the INSA, Indian National Science Academy, uh, to come to Pakistan. And they came last month, Dr. Krishan Lal and five of his colleagues, uh, for the first time that in between the two countries, we had uh, a joining of hands in science. And, uh, and this is Dr. Krishan Lala. We, 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 we decided to start a large number of programs together in different <coughs> fields of science <coughs> because science transcends uh, religious, ethnic, other boundaries. We are, it's a common pursuit of truth. A few words about uh, the UESTP, the University of Engineering and Science and Technology concept, and uh, uh, I persuaded Professor Harun to resign as Master Corpus Christi, and he came to Pakistan, and we worked together on this fantastic uh, program to set up world-class engineering universities in Pakistan. And these were uh, with the Germany, Italy, Austria, China, uh, and these four projects were approved actually by the government. And others which are on the anvil were with Sweden, Korea, and France. And uh, the classes were supposed to start in October 2008. The idea was your faculty, your curriculum, uh, your examination system, and your degrees. And half the area was for the university. The other half was set aside for technology parks so that the companies would come in and establish their, the European companies could come in, or the foreign companies, to establish their R&D centers in Pakistan. So had we had another six months or nine months, this would have worked. Unfortunately, there was a change of government. Disaster struck. The new government said, we don't need engineering universities in this country. This is all nonsense. And so unfortunately, uh, this whole program was suspended and never came off the ground. But a lot of hard work was done uh, in making that happen. And I'm deeply grateful to Professor Harun for all the efforts that Dr. Uh, Savio put in there. Uh, then, and another tragedy, the HEC scholars who were in Europe or uh, in other countries, their scholarships were held back and they did not receive money. So I resigned in protest. I had another two years to go under contract, but I said I can't in all honesty continue as the federal minister and chairman of the Higher Education Commission with my students suffering abroad. And so I resigned. and. Uh, 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 a, a good fallout of that was that the scholarships were restored, although some problems have remained. Sub another uh, interesting uh, development was this vile attempt to destroy the Higher Education Commission. Uh, Fifty-two of our par parliamentarians uh, were discovered to have forged degrees, would you believe it? And another 250-odd parliamentarians had degrees which were suspect. And uh, this was, uh, so the Supreme Court uh, charged the uh, Election Commission in Pakistan 
to uh, look at their degrees, and the Election Commission obviously then approached the Higher Education Commission, and uh, we revealed what was going on, and that these people had forged degrees. And so the whole of the parliaments, both provincial and federal uh, parliaments, uh, many, many parliamentarians became very nervous and agitated about what was going on, that they were just about to be exposed. <laughs> and so they plotted to fragment the Higher Education Commission into little pieces, to devolve it and to distribute the pieces across the country. And a formal notification was issued uh, uh, by the government on 30th November 2010, uh, breaking the HEC up into little pieces and then giving some of the pieces to other uh, divisions uh, in, the, in the cabinet and to other places. Well, I decided to fight. I held press conferences across the country. I, uh, and I was very pleasantly surprised by the students, both abroad and in Pakistan, who rose up. And also all the vice chancellors, 72 vice chancellors passed a unanimous resolution that they did not want this to happen. And then I went to the Supreme Court of Pakistan. And I filed an appeal <coughs> saying that this uh, is unconstitutional. And I'm delighted to say that uh, uh, the Supreme Court upheld my appeal, said that what the government was doing was against the Constitution, and they could not break up the HEC uh, as they were trying to do, uh, unless a new no law was passed. And that meant that this, organ this body, the Higher Education Commission, has survived. Well, I'm just now, <coughs> in the last few minutes, uh, I'll just show you a few slides of my center. I'm a professor of chemistry. That's my first and last love, if I may say. And that's what I've done all my life. So this is just, uh, we have 12 superconducting nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometers in my center. This is one of, one of the most powerful NMR laboratories. There are 450 students doing PhD in organic chemistry, biochemistry, pharmacology, molecular medicine, stem cells, genomics. We have 10 different types of mass spectrometers. There's another mass spectrometer, X-ray crystallography, pilot plant equipment for taking up things to the, uh, to, uh, to the, to the larger level. Plant tissue culture, compound banks, this is the tissue culture facility, fluorescence microscopy. Uh, this is the patch clamp facility for exciting individual neurons. Uh, we give them very weak currents of 10 to the minus 12th of an ampere. That's a billionth of a billionth an of an amp and this. And uh, we have some patents which have been granted recently on new anti-epileptic drugs, uh, US patents. Uh, so individual neuron excitation using these electrodes, computational chemistry, stem cell research labs. So as my time comes up, let me just conclude by saying that uh, the requirements for rapid progress in the developing world, firstly, the human capital with the necessary <coughs> knowledge and skills, technology, uh, a society where, and a system where innovation and entrepreneurship can flourish. And, uh, uh, but most importantly, perhaps, a govern government that recognizes that uh, their real wealth lies in their children, and which invests. Pakistan, unfortunately, inv invests only 1.8% of its GDP. So we are ranked amongst the seven bottom countries of the world today, which is a real shame. So education has never been a priority. This, what this story that you heard about higher education was, uh, uh, in spite of rather than because of government policies. And this was largely because of the full support that we re received and I received from President Musharraf during his uh, time. Uh, and the kind of talent that we have, this is my last slide. Uh, these are students from the intermediate stream. Uh, we have two streams. The larger stream is the so-called intermediate, the HSC, inter-science stream. And the sh very small, much smaller stream is the A-level stream. So we picked up uh, uh, some students, 12 students, trained them for two or three months, and then sent them to international Olympiads in mathematics, physics, chemistry, and biology. And would you believe it, three of them came back with medals, one with silver medal and two with bronze medals. These were, uh, and so you know, there is no short dearth of talent. It's just getting the system right and providing the opportunities to our young so that we can move forward. Thank you, I've done it in 15 minutes.
And a few questions I would say, and I think I won't be given a chance again, so I'll ask all the questions back home. <laughs> 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 so my first question is about the amount of growth that uh, Professor Pa has spoken in terms of research, universities, and higher education. It looks very amazing on numbers, and it looks very amazing on paper, but the reality is Pakistan has got more than 124 universities, if I'm not wrong. I mean, Which, in my opinion, I can be absolutely <coughs> wrong. Most of them are very substandard. They don't need to even exist. I mean, we can just say ourselves and we can compare ourselves that we've had this number of students enrolled in our universities. But being part of academia for the past five years, I can clearly say that in a high educate, the number of students enrolled in Pakistan universities are not required. So I would say, why on first place we have uh, I don't know if I should be mentioning universities like Preston University, the Khan University, Moyuddin Universities, which, why are they even existing when they are even producing very substandard uh, quality of student. Second question is about the uh, PhD stuff. I have, um, I've been part of a public sector university, I think I shouldn't be mentioning the name because we're not here to, uh, to discuss the political issues. I've been part of the public sector university and applied for two years for the faculty development program and my university did not give me scholarship. And I challenge them that I'm going to make it a point and I'm going to go to UK, get a scholarship from UK and I got it. And after wasting two years, I am in UK doing a PhD, not on HEC's money. Why? Because it's highly politicized. It looks transparent, but the system is not very transparent to provide scholarships to everybody. That's not the point that, I mean, some people can struggle, but it's not very easy being an international student to explore a lot of opportunities outside your country, how to apply, and especially, I would say, when this heavy recession the, for, the international, you know, uh, for the universities to give scholarships to international students. Thirdly, the criteria is selected, uh, identified by HEC to select the potential HEC scholar is mostly the NTS test, which you've actually identified I'm sorry, I don't find any relationship of the research abilities with the NTS uh, test, which is highly calculative, uh, uh, which is very highly analytical in nature, even if you are from, let's say, if you have to go PhD in Urdu, which I'm sure you don't have to go to abroad for that, but if you want to do a PhD in Urdu, you have to take that exam of NTS, which involves heavy mathematics and heavy English language, which is absolutely not needed for PhD in Urdu. You need to have research abilities which are never ever tested through that exam. So these are the three things which I wanted to point out. So, I mean, if you would like to answer the why, this is just like that. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Thank you very much. Well, firstly, let me just make a, com a few comments to what was <coughs> just said. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Kamal mentioned this pull and push effect. And, and you said that uh, because of the lack of industrial growth, uh, the pull effect was not there. And it was largely a push effect. Well, actually, you're, we, are, we have to look at, you're looking at two different periods of history of Pakistan. If you look at the period when President Musharraf was there and when the higher education commission programs were going on, there was on average a 7% uh, increase in the GDP. Uh, it was between 6.5 to 7 point something. And uh, the industrial growth also was substantial during that period. The problems arose subsequently <coughs> when the industries largely collapsed. Uh, so uh, during that first period between 2002 to 2008, there was uh, certainly a, a push effect by higher education, but there was also industrialization also occurring, and mm -hmm. that industrial growth was very good. Uh, the second issue about social mobility, uh, I did not mention that what HEC had done was to create a very large fund of about a billion rupees uh, for uh, deserving students uh, who could go even to private sector universities like LAMS or to other institutions because they could not pay the fee. And so there was this large scholarship program uh, which allowed uh, admissions both into public or private sector universities to deserving needy students for a local rupee fund uh, which, which was created. Uh, regarding the growth in the number of universities, it was about equal in the public and private sector. It was not just private sector universities. Uh, it was, in fact, there were more public sector 
uh, campuses in universities and institutions established. So it was about equal, about the same. It wasn't. Uh, yeah, I picked that number up from the 2010 annual report of the HSC. Right, right. Which basically shows a spike. In but that does not take into account the various campuses in different parts of the which of existing universities that were established. If you count those campuses as well, then it was about the same. Uh, what uh, Safran has mentioned about variability in quality, I totally agree with. There is a huge variability. And the problem is that only about 20 to 25 percent of the faculty members in our universities have PhD degrees. So the faculty is just not qualified. And that's why we said, surely it's not going to, we can't change it overnight. We have to invest today so that over a five to eight year period time you will have. And so you will have more than a doubling of the PhD level faculty uh, now and uh, with this program now reviving and continuing. So uh, unless you have quality faculty, you cannot have quality education. So that is the, the heart of the problem. And so I do agree with uh, your comments about, uh, about the difficulties that you face, about the variability of standards and so on. Uh, one program about, you said that the universities cannot, uh, uh, the, the newer universities do not have the necessary equipment and instrumentation. One program that I did not mention was free access to scientific instrumentation to all uh, research students across Pakistan. They can identify, they can send their samples for whatever they need to any institution of their choice within the country. The analysis would be done free of charge by that institution, which is not in their own university. It could be anywhere else in the country. There would be a bill generated which would be paid by the Higher Education Commission. So it was a free access to scientific instrumentation in addition to free access uh, to journals. The point that Professor Harun Ahmed made was absolutely right. You see, our students do not have a questioning approach. And that's something that has to start right from the beginning, right from school level onwards to the university level. The ability to question everything, to que you know, even Nobel laureates can be wrong. But you must have a questioning approach. You must be, of course, on the basis of logic, you must have, you must be able to argue things out and either be convinced or convince the other person. That, unfortunately, uh, is not a tradition in our part of the world. But I hope that that uh, changes with time. Uh, the three points uh, that Asma, you made, uh, that there are many substandard universities, actually you're absolutely right. In fact, there were tomboy operations, just one little house, uh, which was given a charter. The HEC had no control about which university gets a charter or which doesn't. Uh, so the provincial governments were giving charters re left, right, and sunder, uh, till the HEC came into being. After that, we took this whole matter to the cabinet and we said uh, that charters must be given only to certain institutions which qualify as universities. And we prepared a checklist of what is the minimum criteria uh, which makes, which makes uh, f after which a, 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 an institution can apply for a charter for a degree awarding institute. The cabinet approved this criteria, approved an inspection process through which uh, charters uh, can be given. Those substandard universities uh, which uh, were well below the mark were given a certain time to shape up or dissolve or to go away. And uh, so, uh, and these were largely in the private sector that you men mentioned, Preston, etc. And so they did actually, uh, over a period of time, drastically improve. And the situation has, and the, the main thing lacking was faculty. Uh, also, many of them did not have their own campuses, they were rented premises and so on. Uh, but many of them, uh, the, as far as the private sector universities are concerned, there was a significant improvement. Uh, regarding the scholarship program, uh, there are two different scholarship programs. One is the program of the Higher Education Commission, and the other is the university's own program, because there were funds available to every university to uh, give scholarships to their students. Now, the HEC had no say about the university's own scholarship program because uh, I was very careful that we did not uh, intrude into the autonomy of the university. Universities are completely autonomous bodies which make their own decisions, and there's nothing that the HEC can or should do to intervene in the way the universities are functioned. They have their own academic councils, syndicates, and this, and they, so, uh, but the, as far as the HEC scholarships were concerned, uh, there was this open test and I do agree your with your point that it, it may have been difficult for some social uh, scientists uh, to appear in that test, but actually these were school level 
uh, uh, metric ninth and tenth class level maths, which every student should uh, have. This was very simple mathematics. It was not uh, post. Uh, it was not even came. It was well below the even the O level standards of maths. But then we did modify that. There were other complaints, and so we modi modi modified that test uh, to accommodate this uh, th th this issue. So uh, uh, I think these were the my my comments to some of the points that were raised. Thank yes. You. to uh, refer to Professor Hyam's uh, point, you know, he talked about uh, <coughs> difficulties and structural difficulties. Now I wonder, in a society, in a matrix, you know, if you are sitting in a matrix with corruption and nepotism is right, the mindset of the <coughs> society and the people is very different here. I wonder if panel has any view, how are you going to bring about that change? I think that that's very, very crucial. If you want to see return of the investment you put in, I think that that's very important. <coughs> the second thing is, I think, I mean, Professor Atai has done a wonderful job in <coughs> creating this whole process. But I think in order to move it forward, we need a critical mass of people. And I'm not too sure how many people like Professor Atai are around in Pakistan. <laughs> I want to be optimistic, but I don't see that. I, I was very excited to see the, the number of citations you, know, you have referred to. They also noted that the biggest number was the engineering PID students who were born back. Now, I happen to be here, you know, I worked in different universities. I'm a senior fellow now, and uh, dean from Oxford and all that. Uh, I happen to sit on editorial board of, you know, a number of journals, and I, I'm asked to review articles. You know, it might be a very tiny sample, but I'm afraid I don't see any reflection of that. I, I see a lot of publications, you know, papers coming from even Iran and Turkey, but I don't see lots of coming from Pakistan. So I wonder, you know, where, where are these publications? I'll be you know, very happy to look at them. Now, I mean, this gentleman, he referred to that th there's no pull factor in terms of industry. I think while I, I can appreciate that point, but I think it's a, it's a true way process. It's a chicken and egg situation. If the standard of caliber improves, I'm sure there'd be more interest in industry also to take up those people. Or even people from outside the <coughs> team. I mean, in this country, for example, in Cambridge, we don't just get funding from local industry. We get a lot of funding from abroad as well. So I think if you get some level of recognition, there might be a way out. But I do take the point, the present government has really you know, demolished that base. My, my other last observation is that uh, it also tells how fickle the system is. I mean, you put in so much effort, you and Professor Harun, in bringing up this idea of new universities. I think that would have been wonderful for the country and for the students in creating that environment. But how with the change of government, that whole thing collapsed. So that also shows us the, the, other, the negative aspect of the society. But I do want to end on a positive note. I think the information you provided is, 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 you know, really strikes a very happy note. Thank you. We can't change society in Pakistan just like that. I spent a lot of time thinking about what example we can draw. So nepotism was invented here in Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> We, 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 Britain, I'm, I'm a UK citizen, I, to, to me, uh, everything, virtually everything was invented here, football, cricket, all the good things, including nepotism. So there's a guy called Jagan, who was master of a college, and a little later his brother was master of the college. So Jagan became vice-chancellor, a little later his brother became vice-chancellor. Obviously, <laughs> something was going on, but that was 400 years ago. So things changed. So the question was, so more seriously answering your question, I, I spent a lot of time thinking, what on earth can I do where I can feel confidence in making appointments, in asking people to do things, in working with people whose corruption index is virtually zero, in Sweden, uh, in um, uh, France is a bad case, but Sweden, Austria, Germany, hardly any corruption. Pakistan is one of the leaders. There, this is from the, economics, uh, the Economist data book that I'm quoting. I, I, I have the figures. I used to carry it around with me to prove my point. Now, so I spent a lot of time. So I would argue, as Safwan has said, if the chairman is corrupt, 
But if he has to deal with a committee of 10, no way in Pakistan are all 10 people corrupt. There's not, this is not possible. At least six of them will be honest, I hope. So then we have the majority. So what we have to do in Pakistan is to make sure that every decision is made by a committee and a largish committee which should be, people should be, and again, people are not afraid in Pakistan, providing they're in a group. They will not be afraid. So providing we can change the structural balance. So the two points I made are linked, actually. In Pakistan, everything seems to go to the top. So somebody, one person is making the decision. That's got to change, and this is a fairly simple structural change. So we can say, if somebody, whoever is in charge, eventually says, every decision will be made by a committee, this sort of aspect, at least in universities, will end, perhaps decrease at least. This is the point I'm trying to make. I'll uh, sort of uh, uh, leave the knowledge dissemination side, which is the teaching side. Mm -hmm. I'll try to focus on the knowledge creation aspect, which is the research. <coughs> Um, if I could go back to the Cold War versus Bush army, Cold War essentially is the demand side strategy and Bush would be a supply side strategy. So essentially you have been following a supply side strategy. I don't think Kamal it's an issue of growth because the growth could come, growth could be an outcome of investment in research and development. That's what the endogenous currency, Robert Sarum, or Roma would tell us. I think, could it be, the question is, could it be because that the industry and the higher education sector are perhaps working at two different levels of comprehension, if I may use the term. The higher education sector, with all the developments that you have made, is essentially um, uh, essentially trying to sell the publications at the, in, the, in the international markets, you know, getting publications made, getting patents made, and all that. And those patents are of such a high quality, for instance, which make it practically um, not very useful for the local market, which is perhaps at a lower level of te technological comprehension, if I can say so. Um, one of the experiences that we had, for instance, at the University of East Anglia, where the university encouraged students to come up with ideas. So if students had ideas, the university opened up a small department, and they said, okay, we're gonna help you getting it patented, if it can be patented. We'll help you commercialize it, We'll help you, for example, getting that venture capital or developing a business plan or something like that. And we found out the students were much more enterprising in terms of developing linkages with the industry, uh, you know, initiating their own um, small little commercial ventures, which would then absorb the knowledge which is otherwise being created from these universities. Yeah. So I wanted to, the second thing which is, is what exactly is the scope of the enterprise and innovation thing that you talked about in the Yes, I think the first thing that we need to understand and appreciate is that uh, with the HEC programs, uh, a major spurt was given to improve the quality of education. And you can't have the, uh, the industrialists will not come to universities unless they, know they are confident that the universities have the ability to deliver. Uh, they will find it more cost effective to get their problems solved internationally rather than to join hands with PCSIR or with our local universities till such time that our universities have matured to a point that they have well-established centers of excellence which are able to uh, not only do research in their own fields but also be able to solve industrial problems. So it's uh, like a baby which is turned into a, uh, to a young boy but it still has to mature. So our universities largely are still very weak. And uh, some of them have come up very well, as I said, but they're still not strong enough to, uh, except for odd ex centers here and there where they can meaningfully interact with industry. This will take time, and this is then linked to uh, the quality of faculty that uh, is uh, present in the universities and to the extent that they are able then to mature and, and, and do quality research and then start interactions. 
we have the mechanisms in place for university industry interaction as i said up to 80% of the funds coming from the government to solve industrial problems and other mechanisms such as offices of research and innovation encouraging universities to establish technology parks and there are some on the way but still there is a long way to go we need uh, a major uh, major venture capitalists which are missing we need incentivization to for private sector r&d because the game ultimately has to be played by the private sector the government can only go so, so far so uh, unless you have uh, uh, the incentives to the private sector to invest in research and development facilities uh, unless uh, you have financiers and uh, the ease of doing business is facilitated mechanisms of how easy it is to start new businesses advice so that business plans can be uh, developed Uh, properly and professionally for a person who may have a very good idea but he has no idea how to make how to write a business plan so how do you actually translate an idea into something which is bankable so that, that so that kind of professional expertise and advice needs to be in place so there are mi large missing gaps still and there is a process that we are going through which will take some some time for us to mature I had actually uh, three points I've written down, and I was going to uh, make this comment at the end. But uh, since the discussion has become central to this issue, I'll probably address it first. Uh, the idea of push and pull factors that Dr. Kumar addressed earlier on, I think there's a lot of weight in that argument. Um, it's it's okay to say that growth happens on its own. I mean, by the way, endogenous growth theory has long been, I mean, debated, and people might have discarded it. It's not been borne out by history, particularly. Um, the point is that even the time period you referred to during 2002 and 2008 there was growth in the economy of course there was <coughs> figures uh, say that most of that growth and command please correct me if i'm wrong most of that growth was essentially driven by advancements in the banking sector in real estate in construction particularly services what probably dr kamal is trying to say is that industrial growth is actually the driver of that engine or of, of the, the driver of that car or the engine of that car which you want to feed into by producing engineers if you will so all those phd's i don't know i don't have the figures but i'm 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 positive all those uh, phd's in engineering that uh, that were produced during those years could not go back and actually start working for those pakistan has the textile industry is the leading most uh, industry in in pakistan how many of those engineers or textile engineers that were produced even in pakistan now we have a mushrooming you know fashion garments you know one school of fashion design has become tens of universities with branches all over the all, all over the country in, in the textiles how many of those have actually gone on and become leaders in the textile industry they haven't really been employed by the by them so basically it's the you look at the pharmaceutical industry you look at the automobiles industry how many auto engineers phd's in auto engineering have gone on and started working for the auto industry so when there is no growth in the industry itself those phd's would be virtually jobless or doing something they're not trained for in their phd's when they actually go there so there is a weight in that argument that you need to have industrial growth i mean if you were having services growth of course you produce a phd in banking and finance he goes there is growth in that economy he goes to pakistan he will find a job but when there's no industrial growth of course and as you mentioned just now uh, business parks technology parks but those things need to be actively pursued by the government there should be an active industrial policy where there is a link between the research being done and between the growth that is taking place um secondly which was my first point is uh, what uh, Professor Harun raised earlier on about raising the average standard of students in in the country, and also it gels in with the point that Kamal raised about uh, social mobility. That would take us a step down from higher education, and we would we actually need to address primary and secondary education in Pakistan. Unfortunately, the emphasis on secondary and primary education has been close to negative or zero, if you will, in Pakistan. the idea of developing critical thinking the idea of social mobility of pakistan if you look at particularly the the primary and secondary education sector uh there is a stark divide between people who go to the private schools you mentioned beacon house you mentioned grammar school 
and those who go to government schools, <coughs> essentially following two different streams, <coughs> two different mediums of education in English and in Urdu. Those who go to Urdu schools, they virtually, I mean, we talk about they virtually seal their fate going to an Urdu school or a government school because there is no chance of them going to a university and social mobility is far from it. So basically, if, if government policy is addressed, is, is focused, is targeted towards primary and secondary education as well as higher education, I mean there's no harm in targeting higher education, but it has to have that backward linkage where people who want to go towards those large, nice universities, come to universities like Cambridge, get educated, you create a larger mass of those people who move up in the social and educational ladder to come to these universities. So we are actually, when, when we target only higher education, we're looking at only that small segment of society, which actually makes it to that level. Most of them, the others, who don't even have access to primary secondary education, they, they don't really uh, get to make use of the higher education incentives. Um, and lastly, which is partly also a question, um, is somebody mentioned universities like Preston and others, and they were given university status. My question would be, uh, we also saw a lot of uh, universities mushrooming in those years where old colleges with very, very good reputations, particularly I come from Lahore, so I can speak for Lahore, um, you know, colleges which were part of essentially the University of Punjab, and um, they were, one can argue they were working well or they were not working well, all of them virtually fought for university status. So, Kinnaid College Lahore for women, Lahore College for women Lahore, Government College uh, Lahore, all of them were suddenly given university status. I'm not sure if they deserved or they did not. Of course, HEC might have done there, as you said, there was a checklist. But what was the idea of making every college into a university within the same city uh, to compete with Punjab University? Of course, Punjab University still remains. All those colleges, I mean, I would always, when I used to think, I always equated Punjab University with London University, say Lahore with London. And you see King's College London, you see SOAS, you see uh, UCL, you see all those colleges. Essentially, SOAS still uh, has a University of London degree, although it is functioning as autonomously as possible. But after so many years, after such advancement, have they reached this level? Imperial College London only separated very recently. But what was the driving force in, in Pakistan, particularly in Lahore in that case, to make every college a university and therefore also instigating a political uh, game between all these colleges. So King, Ed, uh, King Edward Medical College, I, I was a medical student, so I, I, I know about the, the medical colleges. King Edward Medical College claimed status for a university just because it claimed to be the oldest. And all the other medical colleges in the Punjab, six of them, public sector colleges, were combined under a, a University of Health Sciences. So why, why was King Edward separately made into university? Why couldn't they be combined under one? Thank you. Yes. Well, let me first go back to your first question about the PhD output and the job opportunities within industry. Yes, you're absolutely right. The job opportunities in industries for PhDs are extremely limited. But on the other hand, uh, I can say with certainty that 98% plus of those PhDs who have gone back to Pakistan uh, have jobs. And they have jobs in academia because we need about 40,000 PhDs today and we have sent only 5,000 students for scholarships. So there's an acute shortage of highly qualified faculty. At least the basic qualifications of a PhD are required today, both in the public and private sector. So, uh, so f first of all, there's a 95% plus return rate. So those who are completing are going back. There are about 5% who, who don't for various reasons they, they have uh, not completed their PhDs in time. And those that who do go back, there's a 98% per absorption, not only in the universities, but also in organizations like the Pakistan Council for Scientific Industrial Research, the Atomic Energy Commission, the K KRL, NESCOM, and so on. So uh, there is, uh, getting jobs is not a problem. There may be odd cases where the matchmaking has not worked because the person concerned didn't want to join a particular university. In fact, one of the most frustrating times for a person who goes back uh, to Pakistan can be that he doesn't know where he'll be absorbed. 
And so uh, this used to be a very serious problem in the past because the universities had their own processes of advertising, selection, and, and that could take six months to a year. So what we decided to introduce was a buffer program for one year. So the date you land, you, have, uh, you are in, on, an, on an HEC salary as an assistant professor, and this applies to all PhD level scholars going back under our programs. And so this buffer period then allowed uh, a level of comfort to returning scholars that they won't be sort of hunting for a job and that during this one year process. So th and so our matchmaking uh, was made a year in advance. So that's the first point. I totally agree with, your, uh, with the issue of the very poor state of primary and secondary education. And it's all linked because they are, they, it is from them that the supply comes into colleges and universities. Uh, at the same time, uh, the critical problem at, at, the, at the school level educa education is also the quality of teachers and where do the teachers come from? Mm -hmm. They come from the higher education sector. So if you have better qualified, uh, better standards of higher education, they are also going to impact the l lower level education. So it's all linked. But the kind of focus that was needed uh, in fact, I told President Musharraf once that if ever a commando action was required, it should be at the school level education because that's really be, been suffering. Uh, uh, so I totally agree with that point. So you can correct me if I am wrong that you know much of that uh, GDP increase came from an increase in consumption. There was the manufacturing uh, increase came from investment in textile machinery, which basically collapsed in 2005. After 2005, after the you know um, quotas were abolished. Um, so again, you know, I mean, I would say that, you know, the tremendous work that Doxab has been doing, you know, could be an even greater fruit if, you know, the macro environment within which HEC has been functioning could also be led by, you know, a visionary uh, policy. I just want to make some observations. Maybe Professor Saab has already touched on those issues. Uh, I think uh, we, we don't exactly understand what is a university in Pakistan. Uh, you know, we have engineering universities, we have medical universities, we were going to have law universities and so on. A university is a place of learning where all learning, <coughs> all learning takes place in one place. So that you can have some interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary interaction also because knowledge is, is not divisible. Uh, it's knowledge production <coughs> and Doxab should be credited for putting higher education on the map of Pakistan's economy. He got money for it. It's not easy to get money in Pakistan. Uh, the only trouble is that he only can cared about his own constituency, which is higher education. <laughs> Primary, we have only so much money, and all the money given to the GC was at the expense of non-higher education. Because, you know, if you look at the cake, it was the same. So if educational spending increased in higher education sector, it was at the expense of that. Now, coming back to industry uh, education linkage, who would know better than Doxa, who himself is an industrialist? <laughs> and uh, he would know that our education is backward, but our industry is even more backward. <laughs> and, and what is our industry? Textile, 80% of our exports, which has a declining share in the world trade. You can have as much innovation as you want to, but no. Growth, yes, there was somewhat <coughs> fudged also, but uh, even then it was high, mostly in services. But one, you know, IT is part of services, so that was uh, a major growing sector. I want to come back to this uh, upgrading of colleges and because I had personal experience also after retiring from government. I became Mahbubur Hub Chair at GC University. A great college, oldest, oldest at, older than my Cambridge College, which is Selby. 
and uh, you know if it it was a place which would prepare people for the university, but it became a university itself suddenly. No trappings of a university. It was run dictatorially by college. There were committees in name, but uh, Harun, Professor Harun talked about committees. We have all the committees. Everything is done in a committee. The only thing is that the well, top man... Speak. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but my face is how he spoke. Well, there is uh, that uh, incentive compatibility <laughs> problem in economics. We can talk about it later. Uh, you know, speaking doesn't... Not speaking doesn't cost you anything. So... <laughs> 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 anyway. Now, Dr. here was this great university, my own college. I studied there for six years, from first year to sixth year, and then taught there for two years before I went to the government. But as a university, it was completely lost. My, in my own affair, which is economics, well, there were two PhDs. I was the third. And HEC probably requires if you have three, then you can have a PhD program. So I started one. But then everybody had strong views on what is to be taught. And those strong views were what they had always been doing. Nobody really wanted to change. And everybody actually wanted me to leave, which I did eventually. And to my uh, misfortune, I was invited then by another great college in Lahore, which is again uh, as old as government college, which is FC, Foreman Christian College University. So they made me professor and head of the economics department. I kept saying, don't make me head, I just want to be a professor. No. Now they made me head, so I had to do a few things. They were running an MPhil in applied economics. I looked at the program, there was nothing applied about it. You know, applied microeconomics would be, why is primary education more important than, let's say, higher education? This is an applied microeconomic problem. Similarly, many of the things you just said are microeconomic issues. But we had our microeconomics which, you know, which is just some old textbooks, nothing uh, relevant to uh, Pakistan. So I tried changing that, and the whole faculty revolted. I said, well, I should leave. This is, uh, 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 this is my personal experience, that very good colleges who would have produced good input for universities have been destroyed in So I don't know, uh, mushrooming, yes, but destroying these colleges, in fact, colleges, you, Professor, you must have noticed, colleges have been ignored. Primary education was ignored, but after higher education, since uh, higher education does not deal with colleges, or at least those which are not degree awarding, they were nobody's uh, child. So they have all suffered. Thank you. The Government College University has some very nice centers. The Mathematics Center, I think. I don't know whether you've been to that. The Government I've College. I've been there, and there is nothing Pakistani about it. <laughs> it's it's all East European. But as long as you have good faculty members in mathematics, that's all you're concerned about. We should not worry about whether he's a Pakistani, whether he's from Romania or Hungary, as long as they're quality mathematicians. There are, there are two mathematics departments in Germany. Right. One which has always been there, and this is something apart. <laughs> yes, but you it, know, it has to be embedded into the culture of that college. It is not. So it's, a, it's a nice center which is It is nice. Mathematics. Uh, one comment I want, want to make is like we have another problem and that is of like aging population. It's not aging population in European terms. It is in Pakistani terms where we have a lot of old people sitting on the administrative posts. So 
we have professors like i'm going to give you the example of my department be careful <laughs> <laughs> you're going back <laughs> there is you still need your phd from here <laughs> there is one professor hierarchy is professor associate professor assistant professor and lecturer two assistant professors who have been sit who who are assistant professor for last 10 years and then 11 lecturers and for last 7 years there is nobody is going to become associate professor and actually as long as we have these old professor they will never let anybody become associate because once you are an associate you might turn into a professor one day now we are asked by higher education commission to go back go to pakistan for 5 years you are in prison break because you cannot go out of pakistan because you signed a bond which said that you are going to serve pakistan and then sit there work as a lecturer so all my colleagues who have gone back actually as you mentioned whenever i talk to them back on skype they say safwan can you do this small experiment for me either electricity is not coming or my boss is not giving me enough money to buy chemicals and basically what they are doing is that they are just like you know having a fun time for 5 years they are just going to stay there and then they are going to fly back out because there is like you know we need to put this infrastructure in place that the people who have gone back either appoint them to just to to a total new universities where we don't don't have old people around and we might be able to do something <laughs> or like you know get some old people who really want to work <laughs>
that is necessary. That's what I would like to say as one of my most important aspects of working in Pakistan that I came across. Let me illustrate that with a very telling example of what happened to me here. The very young, extremely inexperienced, in my mid-twenties, I was a lecturer here and asked to become, serve on the board of examiners of the Tripos in Cambridge. Um, I was overwhelmed with the prospect and I sat down with very distinguished board members there all around me and the head of the department, Sir John Baker, made his remarks, I think, rather pointedly towards me because he said a very brief opening statement, we're meeting today to decide on the Tripos results of our candidates and the purpose of this meeting is to do justice. He stopped and we proceeded. I, I learned a lesson that the only purpose of meeting in the examination was to do justice. In Pakistan, we are faced with one other major problem. That is that there must be justice and absolute justice in judging people, particularly students when they do their examinations. This is beginning to happen. Reforms have taken place but it is not universal. So that's the other aspect, that do ju justice in the examination so that everybody has confidence. If I pass this examination, I'm good. I am able and I can face the rest of the world. Um, so that is the other structural reform that needs to be done in Pakistan. I, we've heard Professor Arthur saying how many good things have happened. I'm picking on the things that need to happen. So one is the structural change in committee structure, the other is to do justice in the examination. My third concern was that my third concern was that there's a tremendous number of talented people. I completely agree with Professor Atar's remarks. While I was there, one of the things I was asked to do was to conduct a test. The Swedish university that was being set up said, How do we know that your young people are good enough to take a degree? which will be a Swedish degree from the Royal Technical University in Stockholm, which Sweden regards as one of its prize, prized universities, and it is indeed. We have the highest quality people. He said, we have, we produce graduates who are good as your other university, i.e. Cambridge. Um, so how do we know that the students from Pakistan will be as good? Uh, and they said, we don't want the people who've done, who go to these private schools like Sorry, the, uh, the name escapes me. The one that Beacon, Beacon House, Beacon House. House School or Grammar School, or some, or who go to the top fee-paying schools. We want the average Pakistani student, and we want to test them. So we said, well, how on earth are we going to satisfy them? So they came along and they said, test them, find them, do them, do something. Otherwise, we are not opening a university in Pakistan which will give a Swedish degree. We don't think there's equivalence. So we took a batch of 20 students from the model schools of Islamabad. Those of you who know Pakistan will know that the model schools are the sort of medium level schools. They aren't the top fee paying schools. We took 20 students and we gave them an A-level examination that was marked in Cambridge. I persuaded my colleagues to have the papers back here and mark them. An old A-level uh, paper from the days past before, uh, which um, the results were moderate, modest not terribly good and the Swedes said well no way can we take them so we instituted an idea we said why don't we give them in the summer before they join the Swedish University three months of intensive teaching to an A-level syllabus we did this three months later we gave them a different A-level paper to do three of them Three of the students out of the 20, I would have happily recommended to a, a particular Cambridge college, because they're all getting marks in the 90% in physics and, uh, by the way, this is only technical education. I'm not into the other aspects of education. So in the technical education of maths and physics, they were up to international standards, standards we would have here. Three out of 20, another four or five were certainly, you know, high enough to go to any university they might have had difficulty getting in here. So the other aspect that I would say is that somehow 
we have to raise, I don't know quite how Pakistan will do it, the average standard is to become international. And those are the three points I would like to make. Let me just, um, and I'll direct my comments mostly to the students present here. There are, you know, sort of uh, highly celebrated colleagues uh, present here, but um, it's really for the students uh, who are here, because I'd like them to think about a couple of things um, in this, because HEC, and you know, it's, you cannot disagree with anything that Dr. Atta presented, because these are facts. And, uh, but HEC, as Harun Sa pointed out, functions in a particular environment. And uh, it is about that environment that I'd like to raise a couple of uh, questions. Uh, one is all the changes that have been made, and there is a, there has been a sea change, you know, in uh, higher education. No question about that. To what extent are we poised to reap the benefits of that change? Okay. Uh, what makes universities better? What improves the quality of universities? And here I'm drawing um, upon. A couple of things. One, I I was a student at the Engineering University Lahore, which at the time was the premier engineering university in Pakistan, and uh, we finished our four-year course in about six years uh, in those days because of political turbulence and uh, and violence. And the other is last year, much of last year, I spent uh, going around Pakistan looking at industry uh, for some work that I was doing for the government. And uh, one thing that was quite clear to me was that education, of course, we'll all agree that education is critical you know, um, to human development, to intellectual capital uh, development. But the real engine to the improvement of edu higher educational institutions, especially technological institutions, lies in industry. In countries which are industrializing, you know, there is a pull on universities. So there has been a lot of effort here in Pakistan which has been pushing you know, things in universities, but there has been very little pull on universities. A demand from the market for highly sophisticated engineers or scientists. And, uh, and why is that? Because on the one hand, the government did put in a lot of money uh, into the higher education sector, but on the other hand, it also adopted policies which basically crippled industry. Okay? And starting with the privatization of the energy sector, um, various other policies that have been adopted in industries. Essentially, industry has ground to a halt. And, um, and in, in that kind of an environment, there's universities are almost functioning in isolation. And if something is functioning in a vacuum, it's very difficult to set things in motion and build a momentum for universities to improve. So your best efforts will not yield the results that you expect from them because that particular pull. If you talk to MIT, I mean, for a number of years, I was involved in establishing a number of courses here in Cambridge um, in collaboration with MIT. And if you look at MIT, a number of their departments were set up in response to industry problems. And that's something that Dr. Atal alluded to uh, in his presentation. So Kodak and Fuji, uh, not Fuji, but uh, Polaroid, all the companies that were based around, and many others in the Defense Department, they would come to MIT and tell them, these are the kind of people that we need. Said, we don't have the lab. They don't worry about the lab. We'll give you the money, set up the lab, and we want the people. Right? So there was, a, there was a demand. There was a thriving demand. And in the absence of such a demand, um, it is, uh, it's really, it, it becomes almost like um, you're pushing a car. You're spending a lot of effort in pushing a car, but the car wouldn't start because really the engine under the bonnet is missing. Okay? Um, and, and that, I think, one of the slides that Dr. Atta showed up front almost answers um, you know, itself, um, which I think was, um, the very little money that was being put into R&D by countries which were underdeveloped technologically. And as soon as a country starts developing technologically, I think automatically you will see more money being put into R&D because of that pull effect you know, from, uh, from industry. The other question that I would like to leave the students with is um, there's another function of uh, higher education, which is to provide social mobility in society. Okay? And uh, we want number of countries, uh, if not all, 
want our working class kids to go to university so that social mobility becomes possible in a particular country. But who's going to fund it because they cannot fund university? So that is, you know, a very critical question. How do you fund higher education? And if you look at um, the growth in, uh, in higher education in Pakistan, if I'm not wrong, almost all of that growth in the number of universities has come in the private sector. Okay. Now, what should we think about? I mean, if we have an educational system where excellent education, as is the case in the US, mm -hmm, which is more or less based on self-paying um, uh, basis, you have excellent education, um, some of the greatest universities in the world in the US, but for a few um, uh, people, and mediocre education for the most, right? which can lead to, uh, in the long run, to a hierarchical society and a society which has marked inequality. On the other hand, you have the system in Nordic countries and other uh, Western European countries um, where the taxpayer funds <coughs> higher education, and that may lead to a higher social mobility and a more equal society. So I'll just stop here at these, um, you know, I won't attempt to provide any answers to these questions, but just to leave you with these thoughts. I am extremely thankful uh, uh, to organizers to like, you know, put me in this panel because usually uh, students are on the, on the taking end of all these policies and actually nobody listens to them. So I'm just going to go back uh, to my days in Punjab University where I did my bachelor's and master's in biochemistry and biotechnology respectively. And I'm going to compare it to that, what happens here and what, what, what happens in Pakistan. First of all, there is a huge variability in quality of lectures. So you will get one professor or a lecturer who would be amazing and you can compare that person to anywhere in the world. And then you will have a guy who, have, who would have no clue about what he is teaching and he will still be standing in the podium. Actually, it's like that if you ask President Zardari to give a lecture on gene regulation. So, so it is actually that bad. And, and then Higher Education Commission came into existence and they placed some very good policies like teacher assessment exercises and like students were extremely happy okay now it's our chance we are going to like you know show them that how it is really done so we like you know started ranking teachers and what would happen that we will rank the teachers all the rankings would be changed by the time it either reached higher education commission or chairman of the department would sit on it and say it's biased there is a big conspiracy going on because Pakistan is believe in conspiracy as such Okay, and, and what, like, the biggest problem from it with STEM was honesty, because there were some really, really good teachers who would be like, you know, who are good teachers, they would, like, have a two-hour lecture, but they will come half an hour late and leave half an hour early, and they are still very nice teachers, but the thing is that you are not teaching for one good hour, and, and, they, and, and they think it it's okay that because they are still coming to the lectures and then there were teachers who won't come at all and they will st and they will just send their attendance sheets and will ask students to mark it now if students don't mark it they get punished because they are not attending their lectures but what is there to attend now we have to consider one thing because usually like you know we talk about peer peer pressure that where are the other good teachers why they are not putting pressures on usually good teachers in pakistani universities are sidelined and how how it actually works for example if you have a corrupt chairman he would target a student who is not actually very brilliant he will put him on to like he will give him a temporary appointment and that temporary appointment will ultimately, like that person will ulti ultimately get a permanent uh, position in the department because he would have prior experience in that particular, partic uh, partic particular department and all the good students would be pushed. So usually good students try to find their jobs otherwise either in the private sector or, or they try to go abroad, simply find a good postdoc in some, some universities abroad. So we really need to do some things about it, and I would like to have your input. 
that what should we do about these sort of things because this is basically essentially corruption and other things is quality of research now we usually talk about research infrastructure for the new universities which have like you know there was a mushroom growth of universities during dr atas period in 2002 they might not have very nice equipment but old universities like punjab university or karachi university old universities do have equipment but surprise is that <coughs> i remember that there was some autoclaves like aut autoclave is a machine which we use to sterilize equipment which were not open for last 4 years and they were just packed in the boxes similar example was observed in lahore college for women where there were some they asked for some pcr machines which were never open for for 3 or 4 years and ultimately like nobody is going to use them students want to use them but this bureaucratic structure they they don't have any voice and we don't even have student unions so that they, we can voice our concerns and if we have some student representatives they are highly politicized and they don't let us drink even pepsi in our departments <laughs> because that is being linked to some some other things so so my concern is that our institutes have a very different political climate and what we really need is that either higher education commission or other higher institutes if their policies can influence that change it's coming back to the kamal's point then actually all the students who will go back will be able to make any change otherwise it they, it will go to ruins second thing like uh, i i really want to talk about is higher education commission how my experience was there we need to understand that higher education commission is existing in pakistan and in pakistan like it it will work similarly obviously it worked better but similarly to what how other institutes work so first of all if it wouldn't have been for higher education commission i i wouldn't be here but there was a delay for 6 6 months funding delay when i started my phd and if it wouldn't have been for cambridge commonwealth trust i wouldn't have been able to start and and it it has not only happened to me there are several student and honestly if cct don't exist uh, we 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 won't be able to start our courses in time and we won't be able to study and second thing is monthly stipend so my, when i started my monthly stipend was 650 uh, us pounds and all, all the other student as well which was raised to 750 pounds Hughes Hall where i am from charges for a room like for from 450 pounds to 515 and actually if you try to do budgeting here you cannot do any budgeting you might be able to like you know you spend around 800 pounds but if you have to buy laptop if you just pay just one visit to london or you accidentally like you know your supervisor or your friends drag you to a restaurant then your whole monthly budget is blown away and and we really need to do something about it when other organizations like cancer research uk or gates scholars they are given good uh, like much 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 better amount than this and third thing is uh, is is jobs on return several students have returned from uh, to pakistan but there are no placements so hcc has this placement program when hcc asks them that okay they hcc usually says okay which university you want to go they go to that university that university say aha uh -huh, we need some post doctoral experience as well or they say we need like that okay you can work for a year but after that we don't have enough money we don't have permanent positions you cannot work so some students are like hcc is putting it like this that you cannot return you have to stay in pakistan for next 5 years because you are in a bond whether you do anything or not and and we need something like we need to come up with a system where it should be a bit more flexible that student like students are working here for 6 months and then they can go back work there for 6 months then come back work here for 6 months we need these flexible system if we really want things to things to come like you know things to establish there so i will leave you with this and uh, then we should i think think about that what can we do with the situation
Viewers, we have uh, Professor Harun Saab with us here in Cambridge University. Uh, let's talk to him about tonight's um, uh, uh, talk with Dr. Tahriman. And uh, basically, Asalaamu Alaikum, Dr. Asalaamu Alaikum. Dr. Basically, would love to know, uh, in a nutshell, obviously, you've, uh, you've, uh, you've got great accomplishments. Um, you've, you've come from Pakistan and you've made, made uh, big achievements here in, in, in England and, and especially with regards to Cambridge University. Uh, would like to know a little bit about your journey from Pakistan to Cambridge and, and how would you like to describe to our viewers and then Pakistanis home and abroad? I came here. Um, I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship from King's College to do a PhD in Cambridge. And I came here in 1959 which is a long time ago, and I probably was the first Pakistani to come here to do a PhD in engineering. Um, the college gave me a scholarship because I wouldn't have had the money and my parents would have had the money to pay for it. So the first thing for any Pakistani aspirant for coming to Cambridge is try and win a scholarship. It proves two things. First of all, you have the money to do the degree. The second, it only proves that you are capable of doing the degree. To get the scholarship is the first thing. After that, I was fortunate enough to be asked to take a university post here. So I worked here first in the engineering department, first as an assistant lecturer or demonstrator, then as a lecturer. Then I was promoted to reader and professor, and I ended up my career as professor of microelectronics. I transferred to a different department because the university is very flexible and allows one to move from engineering to physics. The other big change in my life was that Cambridge has a dual system of the colleges and the university. And I was fortunate in that my college Corpus Christi elected me a master of the college. So I was the first Pakistani immigrant to be elected to mastership of a Cambridge or Oxford college. Uh, so to become a professor here was also something that was a, a, a huge step and I'm, my only hope is that this will encourage more immigrants to this country and I'm an immigrant to this country, totally settled in this country, to apply and to get into academic uh, achievements in this country and I'm sure a lot of people will. That's, uh, that is a long journey of accomplishment, sir, and that's totally unmatchable, I would say. Um, I, I, I would ask you, um, Professor Saab, what would you have to say to Pakistanis in general, whether home and abroad or abroad, uh, with regards to being educated and get education, necessary education, whether they're in Pakistan or abroad? Well, the only career that I know about in detail is an academic career. So coming here and for any other person from Pakistan wanted to do a PhD here. First, The first important requirement is to work hard. We start with a natural disadvantage that we haven't got as good an education as the young people here. My first experience of meeting with somebody who had been educated in a public school here was to be overawed with how much does this person know which I do not. So the correct attitude was that I'll speak in Urdu now. Namaz ke waqt utho aur padhna shuru kar do. So the first thing is to study hard and, and work hard and that's a, one of the basic things. And then to teach yourself to learn. So I taught myself to lecture by saying, hey, I have got a Pakistani accent and these people here might not understand me. So I bought the first, I spent my money to buy a tape recorder and recorded myself. In those days they were tape recorders. And so the other thing is, if you're going to have a career in this country, is to aspire to be as the people are here and to compete at their level. We are Zamari Saath, Cambridge University ke Professor Kamal Munir Sahab, who is also our brother, our friend, our friend, our friend. Assalamu alaikum, Kamal. Assalamu alaikum. Actually, Kamal bhai. Yes, yes. Wa alaikum salam. Bilkul tik tak. Kamal, we have listened to your talks with Dr. Tahir Rehman and we are part of the panel discussion. You ask us this question, that the HSE, which is Pakistan, is the failure of this time. And we are seeing that a number of universities or colleges are seen on the scene. And there is a lot of investment that is coming in as well. And there are many promises, lots of hopes. 
आप इस बारे में क्या कहना चाहते हैं और इसके अलावा आप क्या कैसे देखते हैं कि पाकिस्तान में एजुकेशन के हवाले से और क्या हो रहा है आप कुछ कहना चाहेंगे इस हवाले से देखिए जी आ, पहली बात तो मैं ये करना चाहूँगा कि डॉक्टर अताउरहमान साहब की बड़ी अकॉम्पलिशमेंट्स हैं और उनकी मैं ज़्यादा तौर पर बड़ी इज्जत भी करता हूँ और एच के अंदर जो उन्होंने बातें की कि इन्वेस्टमेंट भी हुई है नंबर ऑफ़ यूनिवर्सिटीज़ जो हैं वो भी बड़ी हैं पाकिस्तान के अंदर वो सब सही हैं लेकिन एच के बाहर एक दुनिया है जिसको पाकिस्तान कहते हैं उसके अंदर कुछ पॉलिसीज़ जो हैं वो अडोप्ट की गई हैं इकोनॉमिक पॉलिसीज़ और मैं ये कहूँगा कि शुरू से काफ़ी पहले से जो है वो एक एक किस्म की जो है आप ये कह लें कि डिग्रेडेशन जो है वो हुई है इंडस्ट्री के अंदर ठीक है उसको आप एक बात उसके बारे में हम कर सकते हैं कि 1980s, 90s, 2000s के अंदर एक तरह की इकोनॉमिक पॉलिसी जो है वो परसू की गई है हकूमत के अंदर जिसकी वजह से इंडस्ट्री जो है उसका आप ये समझ लें कि तहस नहस हो गया ठीक है आप इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ जो है वो कई वजहों से हासिल की जा सकती है जो आपने 2000 से लेके 2005 तक जो इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ देखी उसमें मेन वजह जो है वो कंजम्पन लेड ग्रोथ थी तो बहुत ज़्यादा जो है वो आपने चीप क्रेडिट भी दिया और लोग जो है वो कंज्यूम भी कर सकते थे लेकिन वो इंडस्ट्रियल ग्रोथ जो है वो नहीं थी अब जब आपके पास इंडस्ट्री जो है वो बंद हो रही हो जो कि अभी सिचुएशन है और वहाँ पे उनको बिजली नहीं मिल रही उनको और गैस नहीं मिल रही उनको और बाकी जो हैं वो बहुत सारे जो हैं वो मसाइल हैं तो वो जो लोग आप प्रोड्यूस कर रहे हैं हायर एजुकेशन सेक्टर से वो उनकी खपत कहाँ पर होगी अगर उनकी खपत पाकिस्तान में नहीं होगी तो आप बाकी की दुनिया को सब्सिडाइज कर रहे हैं क्या ये लोग बाहर जाकर जो है वो काम करेंगे जिस मार्केट के अंदर डिमांड है तो पहला स्टेप जो है वो ये है कि आप अपनी मार्केट के अंदर डिमांड पैदा करें इन लोगों के लिए इंजीनियर्स के लिए साइंटिस्ट के लिए और उसके लिए आपको एक तरह की इंडस्ट्रियल पॉलिसी इकोनॉमिक पॉलिसी जो है वो चाहिए होती है वो एक ड्राइवर बन जाता है वो एक इंजन बन जाता है ठीक है हायर एजुकेशन जो है वो एक इनेबलर है लेकिन आपको एक इंजन चाहिए ठीक है जो उसको सारी गाड़ी को आगे खींचेगा अभी ये कि आप धक्का लगा रहे हैं गाड़ी को गाड़ी स्टार्ट नहीं हो रही गाड़ी इसलिए स्टार्ट नहीं हो रही क्योंकि बोनट के अंडर इंजन नहीं है और वो इंजन इंडस्ट्री है तो जब तक आप इंडस्ट्री फ्रेंडली पॉलिसीज़ जो हैं वो नहीं लेके आते उस वक्त तक आप बेशुमार इन्वेस्टमेंट भी कर लें हायर एजुकेशन के अंदर तो उसके रिजल्ट जो हैं वो मार्जिनल रहेंगे और अगेन यू नो मीन ये मैं नहीं क्रेडिट उनसे नहीं लेना चाहता डॉक्टर साहब से उन्होंने बहुत ज़्यादा जो है वो काम किया और एच ने जो है वाकई बहुत ज़्यादा इन्वेस्टमेंट की लेकिन ये एक आपको मसला जो है वो रिजॉल्व करना पड़ेगा दोनों चीज़ें अलाइंड होनी चाहिए आपकी एजुकेशन पॉलिसी और आपकी इंडस्ट्रियल और इकोनॉमिक पॉलिसी कमाल भी ये आपने बहुत अच्छा पॉइंट रेज किया चूँकि आपकी बाकी बातों में आया मैं आई वुड लाइक कि आप थोड़ा उसको एलेबोरेट करके बताएं कि या शॉर्टली अगर मैं आपसे कहूँ कि बताएं फिर क्या किया जाना चाहिए जिससे तो प्रोड्यूस कर रही है फंडिंग भी हो रही है बच्चे भी पढ़ के आ रहे हैं स्टूडेंट्स आगे आ रहे हैं तो सादा लफ्ज़ों में क्या क्या करना चाहिए उनको खपाने के लिए देखें जी आपका पाकिस्तान का इस वक्त सबसे बड़ा मसला जो है वो है कि आपकी दो तिहाई आबादी जो है वो तीस साल से नीचे की उम्र से नीचे अब वो सारे के सारे कोई चार पाँच मिलियन उनमें से जो है वो हर साल आपकी लेबर फोर्स को ज्वाइन कर रहे हैं और बच्चे जो बड़े हो रहे हैं अब उन लोगों को आप कहाँ पर जो है खपाएंगे आपने एम्प्लॉयमेंट प्रोड्यूस करनी है पाकिस्तान में ठीक है तो आपको ऐसी इंडस्ट्री लगानी है जो लेबर इंटेंसिव हो जहाँ पे आप इन सब लोगों को नहीं तो आप खुद ही अंदाज़ा लगा लें सोशल स्टेबिलिटी के लिए क्या इम्प्लिकेशन हैं इस चीज़ की क्या नतज बरामद हो सकते हैं अगर यही सब लोग जो हैं वो बग़ैर किसी जरिया मुआश के जो हैं वो घूम रहे हों इधर उधर तो आपने एक तो जो इंडस्ट्री है वो लेबर इंटेंसिव जो है वो लगानी है ठीक है दूसरा ये है कि आपने मुल्क के अंदर इंडस्ट्री लगाने की कोशिश करनी है अभी तक आपकी जितनी इकोनॉमिक पॉलिसीज़ जो चल रही हैं वो इंडस्ट्री लोकल इंडस्ट्री फ्रेंडली नहीं है ठीक है अब आप ये देखें कि आपने जो नेशनल इंडस्ट्री है उसको तबाह करने के लिए तो आपने कोई कसर छोड़ी नहीं है ठीक है आपने बिजली उनको जो है वो आप या नहीं मिलती ये मिलती है तो बहुत ही महंगे दामों मिलती है गैस या नहीं मिलती मिलती है तो जो है वो बहुत मुश्किल से और थोड़ी जो है वो मिलती है ठीक है तो बेशुमार इंटरेस्ट रेट आपके जो है वो बहुत हाई हैं जिसकी वजह से वो इन्वेस्टमेंट भी अंदर नहीं हो सकती तो आपने यू नो इंडस्ट्री पे तोज्जो देनी बहुत बहुत ज़रूरी है क्योंकि वो इंजन है जैसे क्या आप कह रहे हैं कि नेशनल लेवल पे एक पॉलिसी बनाई जानी चाहिए फिर खुल के बिल्कुल सबके सामने क्लियर बैठ के जो सारी जमातें बैठती हैं पोलिटिकल इंस्टेबिलिटी के ऊपर इस तरह इसके ऊपर पॉलिसी बनानी चाहिए ऑल पार्टीज़ कॉन्फ्रेंस ऑल इंटेलेक्चुअल कॉन्फ्रेंस समथिंग ऑफ दैट जी बिल्कुल मतलब ये कि ये पार्टीज़ को बिठा के क्योंकि आपको थोड़ी बहुत 
रेजिस्टेंस शो करनी है अपने आप को असर्ट करना है बाकी की दुनिया में कि जो आप पे प्रेशर डालती है कि अपने दरवाजे खोलो अपने प्रोडक्ट मत बचाओ बनाओ हमारे प्रोडक्ट खरीद लो ठीक तो आपने पाकिस्तान को फैक्ट्री बनाना है या दुकान बनाना है ठीक तो अभी तक जो पॉलिसीज़ हैं वो पाकिस्तान को दुकान बनाने में ज़्यादा आगे आगे हैं फैक्ट्री दुनिया के लिए जैसे चाइना है या इंडिया बन रहा है वो आपकी पॉलिसीज़ जो हैं वो नहीं हैं वहाँ पे तो अगर आप फैक्ट्री बनाते हैं तो फैक्ट्री वाले जो हैं वो आपके पास खुद आएंगे वो कहेंगे जी हमें इंजीनियर भी चाहिए और साइंटिस्ट भी चाहिए हमें दो हम फंड भी करते हैं आपकी यूनिवर्सिटीज़ को क्योंकि हमें ज़रूरत है आपके पास जब इंडस्ट्री होती है तो सिर्फ आपके अपने ही ग्रेजुएट नहीं बाहर के मुल्कों के ग्रेजुएट भी आपके पास आना शुरू हो जाते हैं जो किसी और मुल्क के टैक्स पेयर ने जो है उनकी एजुकेशन फंड की है ठीक है अभी ये कि आप बाकियों को सब्सिडाइज करेंगे व्यूज हमारे साथ ब्रिलियंट पाकिस्तानी स्टूडेंट जो कि केम्ब्रिज यूनिवर्सिटी के स्टूडेंट हैं सफवान अक्रम मौजूद हैं और ये आज पैनल के कंडक्टर भी थे और जो हमारी टॉक हुई डॉक्टर अतार रहमान साहब के साथ हम इनसे पूछते हैं कि क्या एज ए स्टूडेंट को प्रॉब्लम पेश आई है क्योंकि ये एच की स्कॉलरशिप भी यहाँ पे आए थे और बहुत ब्रिलियंट स्टूडेंट हैं माशाल्लाह और उन्होंने कैरी ऑन किया अपनी स्टडीज़ को अब ये अपना कोर्स भी कम्प्लीट कर रहे हैं इन्हीं से पूछते हैं असल सफ़ान असल कैसे आप ठीक हैं मैं बिल्कुल ठीक ठाक बताइए हमें जो भी आपने जो स्ट्रगल किया है यहाँ आने के लिए और सारा जो आपको प्रॉब्लम फेस आई हैं हमें उसका क्विक रैंडअप दीजिए और उसका सोल्यूशन क्या हो सकता था देखिए फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल हायर एजुकेशन कमीशन का यानी कि इसका क्या अमल में आना इट वॉज अ वेरी गुड स्टेप उससे काफ़ी सारे मिडिल क्लास और लोअर मिडिल क्लास लोगों को बहुत फ़ायदा हुआ क्योंकि दे हैड दे गॉट एक्सेस टू गुड यूनिवर्सिटीज लाइक केम्ब्रिज लेकिन जो कुछ प्रॉब्लम्स हैं वो जनरल मैनेजमेंट के इश्यूज़ हैं जो पाकिस्तान के बाकी इदारों के साथ भी हैं फॉर एग्जाम्पल जिस तरह मैं अर्लियर बता रहा था कि आदमी को अगर आना जून में है उसका कोर्स जून में स्टार्ट हो रहा है या सितंबर में स्टार्ट हो रहा है कैम्ब्रिज में मेकल मैस्टम सितंबर से स्टार्ट होती है उसको जब तक फंडिंग रिलीज़ होती है इट्स अप्रैल अगर अप्रैल अगले साल के अप्रैल में फंडिंग रिलीज़ हो रहा है तो उसका वो गैप कहाँ से पूरा होगा फिर एच के साथ एक और अभी दरमियान में जब फंडिंग का गैप आया तो ये सिचुएशन हुई कि छः महीने के लिए फ़ंड ख़त्म हो गए जब छः महीने के लिए किसी स्टूडेंट को फ़ंड नहीं मिले तो वो स्टूडेंट कहाँ जाए कुछ लोगों को कुछ 500, 600 पाउंड हार्डशिप फंड मिल गया बट दैट वाज नॉट एनफ दे हैड टू टेक लोन्स नाउ दो स्टूडेंट्स हैव टेकन लोन्स वेयर शुड दे गो अब हायर एजुकेशन कमीशन ये कहता है वंस यू एंटर इनटू कंट्री आप पाँच साल मुल्क से बाहर नहीं जा सकते हालांकि अगर ये इसको ऐसे रखें कि लोग छः महीने यहाँ रहें छः महीने पाकिस्तान जाएँ अल्टीमेटली वो यहाँ पर भी अपनी रिसर्च कैरी ऑन करेंगे पाकिस्तान में भी स्टूडेंट्स को हेल्प करेंगे और अगर उनका यहाँ से नाता रहता है यहाँ से उनका लिंक रहता है तो वहाँ से मज़ीद स्टूडेंट्स को यहाँ ला अपनी लेबॉरेटरीज में इंट्रोड्यूस करवा सकते हैं लेकिन एच ई टू बी एक्चुअली वेरी डिक्टोरियल हेयर वट दे एक्चुअली वॉन्ट कि लोग जाएँ वहाँ पर वापस जाकर बैठ जाएं और ना वहाँ पर अभी फंडिंग है उनके पास ना लेबॉरेटरीज इस्टेब्लिश हैं कॉलेजेस को उन लोगों ने यूनिवर्सिटीज़ का नाम दे दिया बट देर आर नो लेबॉरेटरीज एंड दे वांट देम जस्ट टू सिट देयर वेस्ट फाइव इयर्स एंड एंड इट्स एक्चुअली करियर क्रशिंग क्योंकि उनके करियर्स तबाह हो जाएंगे तो वट वी एक्चुअली वॉन्ट गवर्नमेंट टू कंसिडर हीयर के बजाय के इन स्टूडेंट्स को जो टैलेंटेड स्टूडेंट्स हैं जिन्होंने यहाँ से पी एच किए हैं उनको एनिमीज़ बनाएं वट दे वॉन्ट दैम टू डू वो उनको कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट करवाएँ सोसाइटी के अंदर उनसे पूछें क्या होना चाहिए छः छः महीने के फ्लेक्सिबल पैचेस बनाएं वो जाएं पाकिस्तान में रिसर्च करें वापस आएं और या आप टेन ईयर का लॉन्ग पैच बना दें कि पहले पाँच साल यहाँ काम कर लो फिर पाँच साल वहाँ चले जाना कोई कोई निगोशिएशन साइड के ऊपर तो हो ना ये किस किस्म की डिक्टेटरशिप है कि नहीं आप लोगों को ये फॉलो करना है और आई वॉन्ट टू एड टू वन पॉइंट ऑल द पीपल हु आर लुकिंग आउट देयर कि अगर ये सोचते हैं कि जितने एच स्टूडेंट जो ट्रबल में है इस किस्म के प्रॉब्लम प्रॉब्लम में है वो वीक विकेट पे हैं इस तरह नहीं है क्यों क्योंकि जब मेरी फंडिंग में छः साल का गैप छः महीने का गैप आता है आई विल जस्ट गो टू द कोर्ट ऑफ लॉ एंड से देखें जनाब ब्रीच ऑफ कॉन्ट्रैक्ट हुआ है ख़त्म एच ई केस हार जाएगी लेकिन वी आर नॉट डूइंग दैट तो ये बहुत ज़्यादा इंपॉर्टेंट इश्यूज़ हैं जिनको हम लोगों को एड्रेस करना चाहिए कि अपनी जो यूथ है जिनको और ये टैलेंटेड यूथ थी हम लोग कोई ऐसे लोग नहीं थे कि यानी कि हम लोग सब जितनों को आप उठा लेंगे सबने अपने अपने रिस्पेक्टिव यूनिवर्सिटीज़ में गोल्ड मेडल्स दिए हैं कि आप इन लोगों से कम से कम फीडबैक तो लें कि आप लोग क्या चाहते हैं और हम किस तरीके से हेल्प कर सकते हैं अगर आपने ज्यूम कर लिया है कि आपके पास अकले कुल है और आपने ही जो फैसला करना है वो ठीक है तो फिर हम लोगों को इतने पढ़ाने की ज़रूरत क्या थी जो
क्योंकि गवर्नमेंट अगर गवर्नमेंट ये सारी चीज़ें सिर्फ हायर एजुकेशन कमीशन पर छोड़ देती है तो दैट इज़ नॉट राइट एज वेल क्योंकि गवर्नमेंट का गवर्नमेंट का मुल्क है तो गवर्नमेंट नीड्स टू बी लाइक वो एच को चेक में रखे एच गवर्नमेंट को चेक में रखे और, और, और दोनों मिलकर कुछ करें तो आई थिंक देन अल्टीमेटली वील बी एबल टू मेक बेटर पाकिस्तान व्यूज हमारे साथ हैं जवाद रहमान जो कि कैम्ब्रिज में पाकिस्तान सोसाइटी के करंट अफेयर्स ऑफिसर हैं इन uh, इन्होंने आज जो डॉक्टर दाव रहमान के साथ आज जो हमारी मीटिंग थी और जो एक पैनल uh, टॉक थी इसको अरेंज करने में बहुत अहम किरदार अदा किया है हम इनसे पूछते हैं कि क्या इनके मकासद थे क्या मोटिव थे ये 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 सिटिंग अरेंज करने के असल जवाद वाल थैंक यू जिस मेन मकासद जो थे वो बस ये कि कैम्ब्रिज में एक तो डॉक्टर प्रोफेसर तार रहमान साहब आए हुए थे सो वी वॉन्ट टू हाफ एंड स्पीक टू द स्टूडेंट्स है यहाँ पर अच्छे खासे अच्छी सी स्कॉलर्स हैं तो द जनरल थीम ऑफ द टॉक वॉज द द हायर एजुकेशन सेक्टर इन पाकिस्तान वॉट हाज़ बिन डन वॉट हाज बिन अचीव्ड एंड लुकिंग टूवर्ड्स द फ्यूचर वॉट कैन बी डन टू फर्दर इम्प्रूव ऑन इट तो आज बड़ा इंटरेस्टिंग डिस्कशन हुआ और हमारे पास चार पैनल तीन पैनलिस्ट और थे उनमें एक यहाँ कैम्ब्रिज के कॉर्पोरेट हिस्ट्री कॉलेज के फॉर्मर मास्टर एंड द हेड ऑफ द कैमिस्ट लेबॉर्ट्री प्रोफेसर हारून अहमद थे डॉक्टर कमाल मुनीर जज बिजनेस स्कूल में पढ़ाते हैं और सफ़ान अक्रम पी एच डी स्टूडेंट सो वी हैड अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग पैनल विद ऑल सॉर्ट ऑफ पॉइंट्स ऑफ व्यूज फ्राम द फ्राम द फाइनेंस एरिया फ्राम समन हुज बिन एट कैम्ब्रिज फॉर अराउंड फिफ्टी ईयर्स एज वेल एज स्टूडेंट हु इज़ इन एच एस सी स्कॉलर सो आई थॉट इट वॉज अ वेरी गुड a uh, very good talk and a very good panel discussion uh, which uh, raised a lot of very interesting issues and it was a very good learning experience for everyone involved very briefly uh, jawad aapka apna experience kaisa raha pak coming from, coming from pakistan and and, and uh, landing into cambridge mm-hmm. how was it uh, well i did my undergrad from uh, from the uk so it's kind of i did my a levels from, uh, from pakistan uh, but having interacted with the people a lot of friends here who are actually hsc scholars and who who did the undergrad in pakistan i think the hsc has made a huge contribution ke itne sare log yahan par aaye aur now now they are achieving uh, world class uh, standard like an education that is of world class standard and uh, most of them are going back as well so i i i am definitely hopeful for the future so i have a very positive experience of the hsc scholars specifically yeah here